Great, excellent. I think we'll get started. So um, thank you very much for joining us here, uh, either live or also this will be a recorded session and lively live broadcast as well, so which is fantastic. Um, so this particular panel is sponsored by the HALO Trust. It's on resilience and prosperity. Uh, my name is Catherine Mulhern. I'm the CEO of an impact fund called Restitution. Uh, it provides litigation funding and support for post-conflict and fragile states in their fight to return the billions of dollars of assets stolen through bribery and corruption. I want to welcome everyone here to this uh, session on resilience and prosperity. This is being hosted by the HALO Trust, and as the CEO of an impact fund, the power of the private sector as a force for good is something that is very much on our minds as well and a driving force in our strategy. We are currently working with HALO on an impact bond in Angola, and we are delighted uh, to be working with HALO uh, on this particular project and also on this session. We have four panelists today. Uh, to my left is Dominic McVeigh, who's a British entrepreneur. Next to him is Veronica Bolton-Smith, Chief Operating Officer of Invest Africa. Uh, next to her is Ibikin Adebayo, who's co-head of Emerging Market Strategy for the London Stock Exchange and a director of restitution. And then next to him is Camille Wallen, Director of Strategy at Halo. So we're conscious of the fact we only have 15 minutes. So the way we're going to run the session is essentially as a Q&A amongst the various panelists. But that being said, we also want to make time for comments and questions from you, the audience, as well. So there are two things. One is a QR code that we have, and the other is a website that you can go on to and type in questions. We also have microphones on either side, so we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes or so at the end of this session to allow for questions. So um, I'm delighted to have these esteemed panelists and want to really open the session to talk a little bit about COVID and the impact of COVID. The OECD put out a report, a prescient report, in June 2020, which essentially stated that the COVID-19 crisis risked creating major setbacks in funding for sustainable development in the global south. The report predicted that domestic economies in the global north would suffer um, significant loss in economic activity, which would lead to a knock-on impact in terms of aid and development. Certainly it's prescient, but it's one of many crises that we're dealing with post-COVID. I think for many of us, the issue in the global south is both financial with debt burdens. It's economic in terms of um, a decrease in economic activity and a global contraction of up to 7%, particularly in the global south. It's also morphed into a health crisis as well for those of us who've been looking at the daily papers and watching what's going on uh, in terms of vaccinations. So really from our perspective, one of the things that we'll be looking at in this panel today is how private capital and other forms of support could potentially help. So I'll um, ask my first question to Ibikin. Ibikin, what do you see as the key crisis now post pandemic that needs to be dealt with most urgently and how do the markets fit as a solution? Thanks, Catherine, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And um, uh, just echo your comments in terms of thanking Halo Trust for their hospitality and also to the organizers for putting on another excellent event. So I think um, there are really three main challenges that I see for Global South um, in, in and amidst the COVID pandemic, and that's primarily challenges around healthcare and its provision, um, population growth in, in centers such as Africa and, uh, and climate change issues. And on healthcare in particular, I think um, an example can be thrown out, which is that in Gambia, where in 2019, about 55% of Gambia's health and aid budget uh, came from, uh, from the UK. Um, in 2021, Gambia is one of the countries that will no longer be supported by UK government. And whilst this isn't just purely a UK government issue, and this is the same of many other Global North donors, um, it creates a massive challenge in, in a country like Gambia and preventable diseases and uh, controllable diseases like HIV, malaria, and in fact, COVID itself um, could well um, uh, uh, become uh, a, a major issue. So it's really a, 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 a huge, a huge um, uh, issue that's, that's currently there in that country. In terms of population growth, and I'm talking specifically here about Africa, 
By 2050, the UN states that um, Africa's population will double. Um, so about 30% of the entire world's population will be on one continent. And there you have a specific issue around education and all of the challenges that come with population growth. And one particular one, again, as an example, is if you take an average mother in a rural area in Africa, she will have six children. If you send her to primary school, she'll have three children on average. And if she leaves a rural area and goes to an urban area and has a post-school qualification, whether it be academic or vocational, that number comes down to one. Uh, however, again, education budgets are being severely um, cr uh, crippled by, again, this inability for Global South, sorry, Global North to continue with its aid obligations. Now, there's in particular one uh, um, group in Mozambique, which is the, uh, it's an NGO called the International Planned Parenthood Foundation. That is set to close in six months' time, and this organization provides education to young women um, and really gives them that kickstart that they need in, 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 uh, in, 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 in their endeavors. And then the final area is, that I mentioned is around climate change. And again, it's interesting, the intersection of 2050, which is Africa's population moving to 2.5 billion, but also global targets around net zero emissions. Um, Africa right now, if the levels of investment continue where they are, only 2.5% of all energy across Africa will actually be produced from renewable sources, which means, again, that as, a, as an entire um, world, we will potentially miss those 1.5 degree targets as set down by the Paris Agreement. So huge issues, but what can be done about this? And I think this is the question that Catherine's posing. To what extent can private investment be used to mobilize and um, come into the vacuum that's been created by the issues? And one of the things that has really interested the London Stock Exchange Group about um, the work of restitution is that it seeks to challenge this issue around illicit financial flows. And for those that aren't familiar with that, a very quick explanation, about $1 trillion every year is lost from Global South countries and Global North countries um, flowing out through either um, schemes or mechanisms that have been enabled by uh, international financial centers. So that's losing money through state-owned companies, through acts of corruption and malfeasance by a range of bad actors. Now, in Nigeria, that is really illustrated between 1960 and 1990, about $400 billion uh, was lost um, to illicit financial flows. Today, that could be worth $2.5 trillion, which would be larger than the sovereign wealth fund of, of, uh, of, 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 of Norway, which is the largest in the world. So what can Global South countries do to mobilize um, their, their efforts to effectively bring back these capital, this stolen patrimony? Well, restitution's model, which is very interesting, and again, one that is being supported and partnered by the London Stock Exchange, looks to bring private capital together um, to fight that anti-corruption and unpick that, um, uh, that construct of, of corruption and actually trace and recover monies that would be put back into managed repatriation strategies uh, across those countries. So investing in things like healthcare, in climate change and energy transition, and in infrastructure and other things that are, are vitally important. So it's very important though, as, as, as actors within this piece, that there's no moral imperialism that's involved. So the work that we do and the work that restitution does is very much in partnership, in deep relationship with the sovereign governments that we interact with. But I'll stop there, Catherine. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. There's a, a follow-up question, which is probably best aimed at uh, you, but also at Ronnie as well, which is, you've talked a little bit about restitution and impact investing. The other uh, term that often gets thrown around quite a bit is ESG and ESG investing. And for those of you who um, follow the financial markets, as of 2020, there was what we term new capital, so new investments in ESG of 51.1 billion in 2020. A single global investment fund has said that they want to deploy 750 billion in terms of investing, financing, and advisory activities by 2030 in terms of impact. Just to give people a sense of that, before the cuts in UK aid, the aid budget in 2020 was 3.5 billion. 
So can Ronnie perhaps explain a little bit about ESG and what that means? What is it? Yeah. And a lot of us think about Silicon Valley when we think ESG. <laughs> right, yeah, so <laughs> that's understandable. So ESG essentially stands for environmental, social, uh, and good governance. Um, over 15 years ago, I think originally it stemmed from CSR, corporate social responsibility. So lots of companies would invest in uh, healthcare, education, um, in, in most cases building um, infrastructures around, around those, those areas. Today, ESG, environmental, social, good governance, a lot of private sector companies specifically that we work for at Invest Africa, I work with, um, are looking to deploy capital into these areas. So environmental can be looking at things like renewable energy projects on the continent. Social could be looking at social infrastructure and social housing, um, healthcare um, buildings, etc. And G is for good governance. So investing in ways to support government, government sorry, in Africa to um, conduct themselves in a way that would attract investment, uh, which is really vital. So uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm uh, the COO at Invest Africa. We've been operating it for 65 years. We work with 400 global companies. Um, our genesis was working with the UK government many years ago um, to support companies essentially who are looking to invest in the continent. Today, what we do now is pretty much the same thing, but we help African governments, and, and that's an area of my expertise, to make sure that they can package themselves effectively so that um, they attract investment and the right investment. So ESG is a big topic. It's, it's an area that most companies are interested in investing and, and deploying their capital, as I say. Um, but I think to pick up what Ibakin was saying earlier around um, the energy transition gap, a lot of companies have been investing in renewable energy projects. However, um, renewable energy is only just a small source or a small um, area in which um, individuals can have access to, to electricity. In actual fact, I think the deployment of capital actually needs to be happening in energy and transmission, sorry, transmission and distribution um, to allow people to have access to the grid. So um, we were talking about earlier how, how can companies, how can the civil society get more involved in investing in specific spaces? And I definitely think that that's one. CDC have been investing via Gridworks. I think it's around $600 million to invest in um, transmission and distribution. So to allow people to have access to the grid um, and to have access to cheap electricity. So that's just one area. Social infrastructure, as I say, DBSA, uh, a DFI in South Africa is investing in social housing in South Africa, and they're looking to roll this out across the continent. But they're just one DFI, so there needs to be huge, a uh, concerted, concerted effort, sorry, from um, different parts of um, society, essentially, to invest in this space. Um, and just to pick up what Ibakin was saying as well before, that in actual fact, with a population growth set to triple in Africa by 2100, so in 80 years' time, to 790 million people, a third of the world's population will reside in Africa. We need to ensure that these people have access to education, to jobs, and we really need to invest in capacity development. Um, and we need to look at areas of growth on the continent and understand how to help people have those skills to actually get those jobs. Um, instead of companies looking outside of the continent for, for, for people to work, essentially. And lastly, on good governance, I'll be quick. Um, That's fine. It's, it's, a big, it's a big area, of, and it's a concerning area for many companies, especially those that have never invested on the continent. So I think um, the rise of digitalization in Africa has been a way in which um, we've been able to ensure that um, there's good governance practices. Um, we've, you know, it limits illicit and counterfeit goods. And it allows um, for you know robust measures to be put in place at um, you know customs and excise as well. So I think there are lots of schemes um, and um, areas in which uh, various organisations can get involved in in investing in ESG. Um, and I've just picked up a couple of those. Um, but lastly, I'd also say that um, with the rise of social media, there has been you know. Uh, individuals and, and large swathes of society now questioning governments. So 
Um, I think that, you know, leaders of tomorrow and leaders who've been in power for a long time perhaps need to think carefully about how long they stay in power. Because I think, obviously, with um, things like WhatsApp and, and um, Instagram and all of these other social media platforms, people are able to sort of interact more globally um, and question their, the rule of law. So um, good governance is, is definitely an area which uh, leaders need to be mindful of. Thank you for that. That's great. A, a quick follow-up question for Ibikin on this as well. And also, I'll bring Dom on this too. So there's a question here how HMG itself can get involved. So we were talking a little bit about the private sector and how the private sector has an interest in this with ESG. So um, ESG investing is being really driven by the private sector. The City of London is obviously a powerful engine of that. And maybe, Ibikin, you can comment a little bit about what the exchange is doing as well. But I think, and Dom, I'd love to bring you in on this. What is your thinking as to how uh, HMG can get involved in this and try to, to be part of this? Because a lot of the questions that we're asking ourselves who sit in the private sector um, is what's next for HMG post-Brexit with the, the announcement of Global Britain? What does that mean practically? So your thoughts on that, I think, would be very helpful. Ibikin, can you sure. jump in? Sure. So, I mean, to, to your point directly, so the, the City of London has been doing quite a lot for quite a while in terms of ESG investing. And um, uh, the London Stock Exchange had a group of um, index products, which are basically collective um, uh, pool products where you could invest your capital ethically and responsibly um, through a series called FTSE for Good many, many years ago. Um, but I think that investment practice has become a bit more sophisticated more recently. And markets have been developed to allow for a, a very, very large plethora of uh, investment strategies, both for private capital, for retail investors, and for others. Um, I think, to your point, what can government do to help support that? Well, I think, number one, there are two things. Domestically, there's the opportunity for government to continue to look at how to mobilize more capital into the UK capital markets, and that could be through things such as tax concessions and through other types of activity that are on the fiscal side. Um, but internationally, London has a fantastic reputation still um, around the globe, in particular its ability to, um, to finance um, these types of um, investment opportunities and promoting the UK financial services overseas um, particularly with partner countries where the UK is looking to act more strategically, is a very, very vital part of UK government's uh, role moving forward. Thank you. Tom, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it's... The British government is talking up a very good game in relation to its commitments to Africa, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, but in reality, I think we've done one free trade agreement outside of the rollovers from the EU. And quite frankly, we've gone from commitments to best endeavours. We've weakened down the trade agreements we've done with a lot of our partners, which were part of the EU trade agreements. Um, we see this in the, the East African community, where the Kenyan Free Trade Agreement, which is available to read, moves away from the EU commitments uh, around aid for trade and has moved to language which is not committal. And that, for me, is the biggest concern. If we're standing up on the world stage and we're making demands, and we're suggesting that people do the right thing. Unfortunately, the money isn't necessarily flowing where the, where the, where the rhetoric comes. And we, we, I, I, I sympathize a lot with our ministers uh, and the government we have, but there is continuous gaslighting around the facts of, of what we are dealing with in terms of making the right steps, the right sounds towards our partners, particularly in the Global South. And I think in relation to this conversation, particularly into Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. We've heard a lot of comments um, and, uh, and facts here around the fact that the population growth in Africa is exponential. But we also must remember that eight out of 10 people in poverty will be in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. So to Veronica's points, we, we really need to start understanding where, where are the weak points now, where are societies going to collapse, where are societies going to fail. And we also look, need to look at the urbanization of sub-Saharan Africa because you know, we can identify Kenya or uh, Nigeria as, as a country that's worth investing in, but actually it's the cities. 
when you step outside of Nairobi, when you step outside of uh, Abuja, when you step outside of Accra, the poverty is, is through the roof. And uh, you know, the, 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 the GDP collapses and the services that are being provided are collapsing. And I'm starting to see businesses not invest based on countries, they're investing based on the cities. How well do those cities work? Uh, what's the infrastructure like? Um, but let's not forget, Africa is full of opportunity. Um, it's easier to do business in Kenya, according to the global doing business rankings, than it is to do business in Luxembourg or Italy. So the opportunities are there. And ultimately, what can the British government do to support this? I think, you know, they're doing a lot of good work. They're very encouraging, but we are losing ground to the work of the Spanish. We were talking about the French, the Chinese, I'm sure, which we will come on to, where we have a government which is launching very green agendas, you know, manufacturing uh, technologies here in the UK. But where are those technologies enabled from? Ultimately, it is the rich soil that is in the ground of the Central African Republics, the DRC, the Angolas of the world, uh, where HALO do a considerable amount of work, which is going to be crucial to delivering uh, a green revolution here in Britain. And what are we going to do to make sure that the African nations are part of that revolution? We're hearing that the energy consumption from the renewables is going to be less than 2.5% yet they have the resources and the ability to take it beyond that. Um, are we just going to take it out of the ground? Are we going to let others take it out of the ground unethically? What are we going to stand up and do as a country to make sure that we all get a fair share in this te technological growth and uh, the, the speed that we must apply to making the, the world not just a greener place, but a fairer place? And without Africa's uh, uh, level standing in that conversation, the world is not going to get better. And we won't be making batteries in Britain for the Brits because someone else would have taken them. And we're, we're going to be sitting in a society where we've got further inequality. Um, so you know, back to your first question, what can Her Majesty's government do? I think there's a lot, um, but actually businesses will drive that change before the government because they move at speed. Whereas we have a juggernaut of a civil service which is bogged down in, unfortunately, bogged down in the, 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 the horrendous situation we've, we're faced with in terms of COVID. Um, I think there are things that can be done, though. Um, we have the enterprise investment scheme. Why don't we start looking at the ethical investment schemes? Why are we giving people tax advantages where they might not employ any women in their business, might not have any diversity, and might be investing in businesses that are causing damage to planet and community? The enterprise investment scheme, for those that you may not be familiar with it, gives you as a British taxpayer uh, up to, uh, and if it's an SEIS, SEIS, a special enterprise investment scheme, you can get a 50% rebate on your income tax for any money you put in a business. So that is a direct rebate from the Treasury. But there is nothing in that guidance where the Treasury says, if this is causing planet, uh, damage to planet or people, if this is not making sure that we have a level playing field, that women are getting paid the same amount of money as men, that we have a diverse representation of, of employees on the organization, that the company is not causing you know, horrendous uh, disaster uh, to, to your communities. There's nothing in there that says that. So you can get an income tax relief. So when are we gonna, there's simple changes that this government can start to move forwards with to really demonstrate that it will give you a tax advantage if you are here to support businesses that do good, businesses that do good in Africa, businesses that do good for you, your planet and your community as opposed to giving people advantages without asking the questions of what the results are. Um, and I think these are debates that we need to, to start having and digging down into the detail where we still, I know the British government is saying it's, it's no longer going to subsidise uh, coal and oil and various other areas, but it continues to subsidise uh, areas in which we know there is still damage being done to society. And I think I'll finally say on, on the, the, the topics of ESGs, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll debate more, there is still a lot of tick box exercise. So if you want to comply with a modern day slavery act, you can write one sentence on your website and you've complied. Does that make you ethical? Does that make you knowledgeable of the impact of modern day slavery? Whereas some companies will have 300 pages of policies around modern day slavery. So what does it mean? You know, the largest glove manufacturer in the world has been banned from selling its goods in America because it's been identified that they have slave labor yet they comply with the Modern Day Slavery Act. They've ticked that box. Mm. So it was, we were relying on NGOs, the goodwill of people and organizations, to go in and dig and get to the bottom of the issues to see that they weren't complying, that they were employing people uh, under modern day slavery. So ESGs, and as we see, you know, 750 billion committed, 
is that 750 billion committed to people that tick boxes? Or is it 750 billion committed to people that are going to dig and dive down into the issues and understand have they gone above and beyond? Because one thing I want to close with saying, um, just on these remarks, is that just because it is legal today does not mean it's going to be legal tomorrow. And this is what we have to remember. We, as we invest in Africa, as we invest in communities, we have to go with our best foot forwards. When Ethiopia opened up to uh, the world for manufacturing, a lot of people ran there because it was the cheapest labor cost in the world. That, for me, was not good for Africa. That's not good for people. It's not good for citizens of this planet. Um, so how do we make sure that when we, as Africa continues to open up and investments continue to rise, are people making investments for the right decisions? Yeah. And if we're going there for a $35 la labor cost, that is, for me, is not a good investment. Uh, and it should not be encouraged. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot to debate about making sure it's right. And luckily, we have a, a very esteemed panel here which are experienced in this as well. So hopefully we can get some answers by yeah. the end. Yeah, you've asked a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. There's a lot to unpack here. But I think... Um, I, and this is, is not doing justice to your remarks, but I think one of the things that, that comes across is, is there are gaps, right? So we have a private sector in the city of London, essentially an engine, but it needs to gap into what's going on on the ground in places like uh, Africa and the global south more generally. We have a government who's not entirely sure what it, global Britain means. There's a gap there between the government and also, I think you've mentioned, and rightfully so, that regulation is behind. So the regulation needs to catch up, that the laws need to catch up, but the government needs to catch up as well. But if these gaps are met, then potentially you have an engine for global Britain, which could be quite interesting. But I think um, one of the things you've mentioned, I'd like to bring Camille into this conversation as well, because in many ways, Camille sits on the civil society side of this. So you've talked a bit about the fact that civil society has in fact uncovered some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And Camille, I know you and I have spoken quite a bit about the importance of Halo Trust being on the ground and also in, in London as well, so providing a bridge between what's going on in the ground in places like Angola and Afghanistan. Um, but it would be interesting to get your view in terms of the bridge between civil society, the private sector and the government. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm slightly in awe in a way, because I'm certainly no finance expert. And so in these situations, you go, wow, what a privilege to be next to all of you guys and, and to have sort of friends and colleagues like you that, that, we, that we learn so much from. And where does Halo come from in this? You know, what does a landmine charity know about impact investing and innovative finance and how to leverage that? Well, I think the issue is we, we look at, we're looking at it from the issue base. We're looking at what are the issues and the problems that we're, that we encounter within our sector and what are the opportunities out there that we should explore and not being afraid to ask questions and, and, and find great people like you guys to, to, to ask the questions and find out what we don't, don't know and don't understand. So looking at mine clearance, the global mine clearance um, sector has a gap of over $1 billion to achieve completion in, to complete clearance of all landmines in countries where conflicts have already finished, sometimes finished 30 or 40 years ago, and people still can't use their land because it's still contaminated by landmines. They've still got a daily risk of, of that. We know we can quantify that, that issue. We can quantify that problem. Um, and, uh, but what we can't do is, uh, well, what the, the sector has failed to do so far is to find that missing one billion. Now, Ibikin presented some fantastic figures at the beginning. We're, we're looking at actually the opportunities and what other sources of finance are available. In our sector, 70% 70 of our current funding comes from five government donors alone. And we can't just keep going back to the same five government donors and asking them for more money every year, please. We know that's not going to happen. And we've seen you know, cuts in, in, in UK aid this year. And so we need to think differently about it. And actually, we think that the onus, and this, there is a responsibility of civil society and NGOs to go looking for that, to go asking the questions and trying to understand the things that you don't know, not to expect the status quo to return, not to want to go back to the way things were last year or the year before when the budget was better, because that's easy, but to actually chase down something that might be a little bit more complicated, but better. So looking at Angola, for example, Impact investment um, we see as one of the 
really, really crucial uh, sort of solutions to completing clearance of all landmines in Angola. But we don't just want to look at it as an issue of let's complete clearing all the landmines in Angola, but why is that related to all the other issues that, that my fellow panelists have raised today? How is that interlinked with conservation and climate change and um, the economic diversification of the country? How is that interlinked with trade and prosperity, agricultural diversification? That's what, where we see ourselves. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for impact investing to be able to bridge those gaps. We're treated in sort of NGOs, there, there tends to be this, this, this disconnect between international um, government donors, bilateral donors. It's very siloed. I hate the word siloed, but it is. And with, with, we're treated like, okay, you're the landmine people, they're the agriculture people. We had a fantastic presentation um, earlier on malnutrition. You know, they're the nutrition people. They don't actually connect us. We're not, we're not told to talk to each other to connect the different um, avenues of funding and, and opportunities and to understand the bridges between our different activities. So we've got to do that ourselves and I think we've got to do that through different forms of finance and, and that this is one of the opportunities that impact investing could bring us. Um, I think, I, I mean, I could talk a lot more, Catherine, to the specifics of how we're doing that in Angola. I don't know if that's what you want to, where, where you want to go. Yeah, I think yeah. it would be useful in many ways. And Iba can maybe can also jump in here a little bit. How, how do you get the private sector involved in something like this? So we've talked a little bit about, um, so it will cost 200 million to demine Angola. So how, do, how does the private sector get involved? Is there a profit involved with that? How do donors then get involved as well? Because a lot of what we'd like to do is really set a bit of a roadmap for people to explain how we can get these trillion dollars, for example, of illicit financial flows, so back into the system and providing support to the poorest. Or how do we get these assets that you know, in, people in London potentially could have and could invest in? So I think, yeah, a little yeah. bit more would be sure. good. So on this, as, as you say, in Angola, we're looking at roughly 200 million to complete that clearance of all landmines in Angola. Um, and we're looking at an impact bond model, as, as Catherine mentioned earlier. And to, to make that impact bond work, we effectively need sort of five key components, really. The impact investors, first and foremost. The impact investors are, and I think Ibigan could maybe talk more to this about where exactly we can draw that from, but the impact investors yeah. are, they front up the capital. They front up the capital to be involved in, in, this, um, uh, in this activity. There is a, certainly an ESG component of that, but also they receive a return on their investment. And we're open and honest that, you know, we accept that there, there is gonna be a return, often between about eight to 12%, depend, depending on the, the, the structure and the, the, the way in which the payments are, re, um, are, are processed. But they're, and they're the ones bearing the risk and they will receive their, their return once results and measured outcomes have been achieved. What you also need is an outcome payer to guarantee, and they're the ones that will be repay that initial investment with interest. But the benefit for that outcome payer is that they're effectively buying a completed product. The funding's not coming in and until the activity has been completed and the outcomes have been achieved, measured and verified. And so, it's reducing the risk, and there is an opportunity there for government donors to do that as well, and also defer payment by, by, by being that outcome payer. Then you need the impact providers, the service providers such as Halo or, or other NGOs uh, in country who are delivering that activity, um, and the investments are dispersed to them uh, to deliver the activity. Once that's completed, the, for, the fourth party in, in my list is the sort of third party verifier, and then we need to verify that the activities have been conducted as planned, but not only that, that they have met some pre-agreed outcomes. So we, everybody sits down at the start of this and pre-agrees what the outcomes are going to be. These get verified by a third party. And then that process of repayment um, with interest to, can, can, uh, can take place. The final, and I think really key component of this, I said, I mentioned five, is actually we need something that convenes that in the middle. We need a sort of board that brings all of that together. In, in, the, um, and in the example of Angola and clear, mine clearance in Angola, the Angolan government 
obviously. We need to work to their national plan. We need to support their national strategy. They're the ones that know exactly how much is needed every year and where to and who the best service providers in country would be to deliver that to. So we can't possibly do this without the involvement and work of, of the effective government and the, then working towards their national strategy. Great. And one of the things you've mentioned, which is quite important, is the government involvement and also the community involvement, as, as Dom has mentioned before. So I think one of the, the historical criticisms of aid, it's been very top down. Um, and Ibikin, I know you and I have talked about the importance of sort of government involvement uh, and also prosperity models. And I think that fits in as well with some of the questions that are asked often, you know, what, so why should, for example, the UK government be involved? And uh, you know, why is this important? And there's a trade element to this as well because it unleashes and unlocks yeah. capital that can come back up to the UK. But maybe, can you speak a little bit about prosperity agendas? Yeah, I, th I think um, just, just actually, before I maybe mention something about prosperity agendas, just taking on Don's point with regards to the private sector moving faster than government. I mean, the reality is that there is, there is enough capital out there today to not only fund the, the mining, the land mining project, but several others. If you have a look today at the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing, so this is a group of investors who have now subscribed to UN's various covenants around how you invest in an impact manner. There's something like 3,000 individual global organizations. So Norges Bank, Calster's the largest pension fund in the US, pension funds in the UK who've signed up, and they have assets under management of over $103 trillion. Now, that is several times the size of the global economy. So there is the money out there. The, the issue is about how to really create the investment op opportunity for these uh, types of investors. So although, and here's a bit of trickery which I'll, uh, I'll unveil to you all, Although they claim not to be worried about the financial return and de-emphasizing that, they actually do want something back. And what they want are the peripheral benefits. So if you're doing landmines and you're clearing landmines, it's creating carbon credits, they want the credits so they can trade those on the market. They want up to 14 different types of nature-based credit, which will come from a mining, a land mining type credit, uh, sorry, um, type um, initiative. Um, I, was speak I had a fabulous conversation with a gentleman yesterday from a company called Regen, which is a farm regeneration company, which maps out using AI technology how farms can come back to being naturally um, uh, um, disposed and effectively taking away all the things that we put in, such as fertilizers and other things, and replacing them with what the natural terrain needs. And, Again, the investors are not investing into projects like that, where the yield in terms of both crop um, and financial yield is there until they see these peripheral benefits. So it's vastly important that the private sector is made aware of the additional capabilities. Then you can bring government in, because government can hopefully legislate and hopefully create the right uh, uh, enabling environment. Excellent. So, but in, in the context of government, one of the things that we've been talking about particularly post-COVID, uh, post is governments are back, right? So it is in many ways a new or rebalancing for national governments with healthcare infrastructure potentially um, being woefully underprovided for, with sort of infrastructure more generally being in increasingly important. And one of the things, Ronnie, I know you and I have been talking about is the African continental free trade area and the importance of that, because we've been talking a lot about investment, particularly inward investment. But I think having the national government piece and also having the regional piece as part of this conversation is very important. Um, I, I don't know what your views are on it and how it's developing. Do you see this as, as a potential counterweight, for example, to what's going on in the global north around trade? Yes, um, so thank you, Catherine. And may I just say quickly, really delighted to be on this panel with such a such a great number of speakers here um, and such a wealth of knowledge and I'm so delighted having spent 18 years in this space specifically on Africa that finally we have a you know a conversation with private sector civil society 
London Stock Exchange Group, Dominic, you know, it's, it's high time that we actually had this opportunity to actually discuss what we know and share our information with the wider public. Um, and, and, and no, so no disagreements. <laughs> no disagreements there, no. But around AFC FTA, so the African Continental Free Trade Area, um, I personally was very excited when this came around. It was ratified last year. Um, it's exciting, it could be a game changer, and I say could be because, you know, there are 55 countries on the continent that they have to coordinate, essentially, to, um, to, to, to create Africa as a trading block with the rest of the world. So the potential is huge, um, and the cross-border trade um, opportunities are, are vast. Um, I can speak from personal experience, having run my dad's business, He's, he runs a manufacturing business in East Africa. And, you know, for, for him, it's very vital that, you know, things like Forex exchange and things like that are very uh, important to a growing business um, in a region. Um, the African continental free trade area, I think, will have some challenges before it. It's been ratified, but it's the implementation, I think, will be the, the key to actually making it work. Um, as I say, there's so many countries to, to, to look at and, and, and make sure that they're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, it's exciting from the point of view that um, there's the opportunities for job creation um, and there's the opportunities for skilled labor to move around the continent. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, um, it's all about encouraging uh, individual countries to look at how they can become experts in specific fields. So in Ghana, for example, uh, they grow cocoa. And I know more recently, the head of state has said that he isn't going to export the cocoa anymore. He wants to process that in country and have his own manufacturing plants. And I think that's really very key to ensuring that there's capacity development in country and providing those necessary jobs for, as we've said, you know, for a growing population in the next few years. Um, speaking from a personal point of view, once again, um, I started in this space. I started in the Africa space because I had a passion and a desire to ensure that um, there were access to jobs for, for those I knew on the continent and for family and friends that, that I knew were out there. And when I was about 14, I remember going out to Kenya with my mum to a supermarket and seeing Kenko on the shelves. And um, my mum was about to pick it out and then she kind of shook her head and I said, you know, what's the problem? Is it not the variety that you like? And she said, you know, it's just ridiculous because I have to pay eight pounds for this jar of coffee, um, which is grown about 10 miles up the road but actually it's being processed outside of the country in the UK and then repackaged and sent back to Kenya and Kenko, Kenya coffee. Um, not to dumb it down because I actually do have plenty of Kenko jars, my husband can attest to that at home. But I think it's important just to bring that point home is that actually we need to make sure that we have processing plants um, in, in regions. And it's not just about the African continental free trade area, they're actually regional blocks. So there's East African community, ECOAS, which is in West Africa and SADAC. And I think uh, we talked about the UK government, they need to work far more in sync with these regional blocks to understand what the issues are in those blocks before looking at Africa as a whole. Um, and also look at those um, country development plans that uh, Camille mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, each year, each government in Africa will set out its national development plan and they list their key areas of investment manufacturing, agriculture, and so forth. And we need to be looking at that as a way to say, okay, let's, let's look at what they need and how can we support them. There needs to be a conversation with Africa in the conversation. I think that's a vital point to make as well. Um, so yes, the African continental free tra trade area in summary is, I think will be a force for good, but I think there's a lot of work there still to be done to make sure that it, it, it works well. Excellent, so you begin, I think you had a... <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks, we have agreement from the floor. If, we can, if you um, want to also say, and we'll also ask for questions from yeah. the audience as well. I, I just wanted to reinforce one of the points that, um, that, that Veronica made just now, which is the fact that the, the African Development Bank have done a study in terms of the impact of $1 invested, for so foreign direct investment invested into the manufacturing sector versus the oil and gas sector. And for every $1 invested, you will get 17 times more jobs created in the manufacturing sector than you will in the, in the fossil fuel sector. So your point with regards to um, manufacturing in the continent is hugely important, particularly one in terms of job creation and skills growth and those things that are currently absent. So I agree. Excellent. 
Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we are also getting some questions from the floor. I have to say my eyes are terrible. So if I've skipped your question, it's because it's too small. <laughs> Um, so one of the questions, how can innovative finance be used to bridge different sectors to, for example, mine clearance and agricultural development? I think, Camille, that's one for you. The yeah. one I, the question I'd like to ask Dom as well, just to come in on, on that in terms of the practicalities of sort of building in um, or, or developing not only agriculture, but also manufacturing in the Global South, how does that help the UK? But Camille, maybe you could answer the, the question. Sure. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, as I alluded to earlier, but without giving the specifics, we can, which we, we're, we're currently receiving through bilateral aid through our traditional donors, funding for four different purposes from different pots. So we're looking at innovative finance, the impact bond model as one example that we've discussed to try and bring together funding that comes from those different sources and say, okay, you're interested in both um, uh, clearing landmines and agricultural development, so why not pool your funding together into this one pooled pot? Ultimately, that would create economies of scale and, and uh, remove some of the overheads and the structures um, involved in those. So through an impact bond, you could end up attracting two different types of donors. You could have two outcome payers, two governments, or different uh, interested investors all pooling into the same thing. And then it also enforces, it, it, it makes the NGOs work together in country. It makes even the different, say, Angolan government departments work together on that. And you've got a joint plan that goes from minefields through to lovely fields of coffee beans. I mean, to, to your point and uh, um, to your question, Catherine, and, and what Camille was saying, I, I'd like to highlight the work that you've done in Somaliland, um, which is bustling with investment now because the Halo Trust were able to demine Somaliland. Uh, and the moment they got those risks out of the ground and got communities engaged, massive investment went into the port in Berbera, uh, big investment into one-stop border posts on the Togwajale border crossing between Somaliland and Ethiopia. You have the Hargeisa and Berbera corridor now, of which trucks are moving up and down. They were not doing that before Halo came along. Not only that, Trademark East Africa, the UK's flagship aid for trade program, is now operating in Somaliland, working with the customs agents, uh, the digitization of the ports, how goods are coming in and how goods are going out. We're now seeing opportunities for light manufacturing. So, uh, Dubai World Ports has invested hundreds of millions. CDC is, I think, committing to 30 million of investment. This is a region that has peace. This is a region which is still you know, has a, a legacy and continues to have issues with landmines, but Halo are working at pace to overcome that. And businesses have turned up and investments have been made, jobs have been created, and we're bringing stability to the Horn of Africa, which as we know, not much stability currently exists. And that was simply because Halo went in there and started getting those mines out of the ground. And th that's where, if investors can get on early, uh, if we can structure things in the right way, why, why can we not have more examples of Somaliland? And I just also want to say, you know, back to the manufacturing, Catherine, um, following on from there. I, I, some of you might be wondering, what's Dominic doing sitting here? What does Dominic do? <laughs> I created 6,000 jobs in Kenya in less than 18 months. My business was doing $50 million a year of exports in uh, less than two years. And that was because the infrastructure had been well thought through, the manufacturing processes, uh, the customs clearances, the ports, a lot of that work also done by organizations like Trademark East Africa. I now have a business in Ghana. I've been there two years, and uh, not for the, the great business environment that Ghana offers and the fantastic people and the expertise, but I've only been able to create 600 jobs and do about $10 million of export. And this is because they haven't had that investment into their trade the same way that the East African community has, picking up on what Veronica was saying. I, I have operations in Benin. It's impossible. It's so hard to work between Ghana and Benin, neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. So there's so much work to be done in these regional hubs of which Veronica's talking about to make manufacturing work. Kenya got a lot of investment. It continues to get a lot of investment. But, you know, day-old chicks, 50,000 of them are dying at border posts or getting killed because the paperwork's wrong. Mm. That used to happen between Kenya and Tanzania. 
It doesn't happen anymore. Goods are moving. The cost of transport is going down. Trade is happening. To make that roll out across the rest of the community, we, we have to make it possible for manufacturing to move, goods to move. I'm in Ghana because it's quicker to America, but it takes two weeks to clear in the pool. So what's the point of being nearer to America than mm -hmm. Kenya? Right? So these are the challenges that we face. So to get manufacturing moving, creating those jobs, the, 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 the red tape has to be um, removed. Understood. There was a question here. I think you've, you've more or less answered it, but there's, there's a probably in the final piece to the puzzle, which is, um, well, well, two questions. How does it improve the lives of people in these countries? So that's the first question. I know, Camille, you had mentioned the fact that often with Halo Trust, once the, the, um, the mining is complete, often farmers will move back into the land even before the certification has been complete. Mm. Um, and the second question is, how does it improve trade? And there's a, an embedded question here, which is how does it improve the UK? I think this is an important yeah. one, and, and one we'll end on. I think at this point we're probably more or less out of time. I, I, will, I, will, be, I will be quick. It, in, why, well, how does it better fit, fit Britain? I've touched upon this. We want a green revolution. Who are our partners in that green revolution? It's African countries. It's our, our, our friends in Africa. How do we, what, what does that mean for the Treasury? Well, if British businesses invest in Africa, and they invest ethically, because doing good is good business, mm -hmm. that creates jobs, creates thousands of jobs. So we've brought stability to a part of the world which we owe a duty to bring stability to. At the same time, we're bringing in tax revenues for those host countries where we're investing. And at the same time, the British businesses that are investing are going to be paying more tax to the Treasury. And the consumer here in the UK is going to get their goods cheaper, is going to get that green revolution, and is going to hopefully, maybe, their tax bill will come down because British businesses are paying more tax. Mm. I'm sure that bit won't happen, but ultimately... <laughs> You know, British business is succeeding. Have to, we, we have to do it hand in hand. We, and we have to do it ethically. And Veronica's the expert in this space. She's working in more countries than I am seeing this. It's, it, it is good for Britain. Pfizer. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it is very good for Britain. You, you know, coffee. It's, where's it coming from? Ethiopia, Kenya. But they should be producing it in Kenya. Why are we sending it to Italy to roast? Why can't we roast it in Nairobi or Addis? It'll probably taste even better. <laughs> right? It's going to be fresher to the source. So these are the things that the British public or... Yeah, supply chains, I think. Yeah. Definitely well, Ronnie, do you want to... Do you, you can have the final word on no, this. No, no, I, I yeah. no. I was just going to say, I think supply chain is key to um, Africa's growth story, um, making sure that we, um, we support that. And also, I think um, infrastructure development is vital. We've talked about COVID at the beginning. And I think, you know, it's one thing to, to have the vaccines, but actually it's the road networks, it's the haulage, it's the refrigerated trucks. We haven't thought about these things. Um, and if we can't, if we bring the vaccines in, how are we going to get it to, to the provincial areas? And something that occurred to me the other day, in fact, I should really make my millions from this idea, is that Coca-Cola has been doing business on the continent for years and years. I mean, I don't want to guess, but a long time. But they've got one of the best supply chain networks in the world. You can find Coca-Cola in almost any village in any part of Africa. Why are we not looking at them as a source of, you know, mo mobilizing and moving these vaccines to the areas that need it? Currently, Africa is under, you know, its second, third wave. If we don't start addressing that now, you know, we're not going to be able to do all of these business um, interactions that we're talking about today. So I think we need to start talking to people that are already doing this properly and correctly and supporting them, you know, and having that conversation. Coca-Cola, ring me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Ibrahim and Camille, any last words? No, yeah. I'm You're good. good. All right, very Thank good. You. Thank you. Thanks very much to the audience for spending time with us. It was a very enlightening session. Thanks very much to the panel. We'll be around afterwards if you have any questions for us. So thank you.